So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Top Talk guest webinar session. Hi, Ellie. I know you're in the wings. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank Excellent. you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been great. Uh, we've been trying to get this off the off the ground for a few months now, so we finally got you live. I know you've got a bit of a cold, so thank you for joining us. So I know, uh, please just bear no with worries. us. Guys. Apologies, I will, uh, I will try and make sure I cough all the way from the mic. Sorry if I get you all there. Excellent. Um, Ellie, just before we get started, and I hand you over the screen to go through, um, obviously, your presentation, just tell everybody tonight just a little bit about your sort of journey into photography and how you sort of became this uh, this newborn and a maternity specialist. Okay, um, well I used to be a teacher uh, and I kind of fell into that because I like travelling um, and I like travelling because I like travel photography so that was always a big hobby of mine. The thought of taking photographs of people and directing and posing them absolutely terrified me so the thought that I have a studio one day was never ever on the cards um, but it all kind of changed when I had my own children. My first son was born really early um, at 27 weeks pregnant and in neonatal care for quite a while and one of my relatives gave me a camera and told me to take pictures of his journey every day. So I did, and then I carried that on with all my subsequent children. And it was photographing them as babies daily that I got more and more into the newborn photography and discovered a world I didn't know was there. And what I loved about newborn photography, as well as being baby mad, was that you pose them yourself. You don't need to ask them to move here to stand there. You just kind of gently move them around yourself. You don't have to talk it all through. So that's how I kind of fell into the world of newborn photography. Um, it fitted in really well with raising a young family as well and as I, the, I kind of did teaching part-time and photography part-time and when I earned more on the photography I was able to drop the teaching and then go for it full-time and take on the studio um, and then learning to pose maternity was interesting but I've absolutely fallen in love with posing people now which I never thought I'd do so it's been an unexpected journey but one that's continuing and hopefully I'll keep growing and learning and diversifying Brilliant. So, well, there you go. You summed that up nice and nice and precisely. So, brilliant. So, guys, we want you to interact with Ellie tonight. So, we do want you to pose your questions for her, uh, especially with anything that she's talking about. So, please use the question panel. We're going to sort of take pauses through the presentation to ask Ellie the questions and get them over to the answers to you. But we've allowed plenty of time at the end. And also, obviously, we're going to talk a bit of bit detail about the sort of workshops and training that Ellie has to offer. But she's doing a great 10% discount on all her courses for you tonight. Ellie, I'm going to hand you the screen love so it's coming over to you now thank you very much okay so today I thought we'd look at making newborn photography work for you um, and also people always say oh but it's such a competitive market now so there are lots of different things we can do that you can put in place to help your business grow and thrive um, so what is newborn photography it's posed images of brand new babies but there is a massive growth in the market for it. There is more competition, definitely. There's lots more photographers taking it up all the time. However, there are also a lot more clients. When I first started out in newborn photography, there were probably about five of us in the UK that I knew of. We all used to chat on Flickr, and we all helped each other out quite a lot. But our biggest problem was letting clients know that our service existed and explaining what newborn photography was. I used to meet a lot of people who would say, oh, I wish I knew about you earlier. So the big challenge we had was trying to find clients in those really early days of having a newborn and trying to explain to them what the service that we offered was and why they needed it. It's all changed now in that most people will have a baby, they'll have a 3D scan, they'll have a baby shower, and then they'll book a newborn photographer. So the demand is out there already. So you're already so although there's more competition, there's a huge, much, much bigger market. It's become very mainstream and very normal to have newborn photography. Um, Probably within a 60 mile radius of myself and my studio, I could name over 45 good, strong newborn photographers that I think people could use. So there's a huge amount of competition, but there's also a huge amount of babies. And a lot of us are fully booked and kind of we refer them on to each other. So don't be in fear of your competition, but just know that there's enough babies out there, that there's enough work for most of you to get a lot of babies in. So why does it make good business sense then? Um, when I first started out, I looked at doing um, under five-year-olds, but the big advantage with newborn photography is it's a luxury experience, and it's a really limited opportunity. They can't come back to you in four or five weeks and get the same photographs again. If somebody comes to you with a one-year-old or a two-year-old, and they come back the next month or eight weeks later or six months later, they could end up with a very similar set of images. But with the newborn, because it's such a small, tight window of opportunity, 
um, you can really sell that well. It, I find it encourages people to spend more, they invest more, and they know that it is a one chance, they can't get it back again. I found for me personally, it's really helped lending itself to specialist branding. Um, to be the baby expert, the baby whisperer, there's lots of people who use that kind of generic term. But for clients out there, when they know that you just specialise in babies, it makes you stand apart. But doesn't necessarily mean that you actually only specialise in babies. So I do maternity and I do art nude and I do some dance photography. But I have them under different branding. That's the way I chose to do it. And for me, I just think it makes my clients see me as the specialist in each field. So when they're going to look at booking you, everything on my website is all just baby related. And it's a bit like when people get married or have a baby, they go in a little bubble. So if those of you who are married and you've gone through that process of looking at dresses and cakes and venues, they kind of absorb it. So when you have a baby, they look at slings and prams and high chairs and push chairs and photographers. You fall into that kind of people that completely immerse themselves into it. So it really loans, your, your branding can loan and sort of strengthen that um, if you go down the sort of specialist route with it. I've also found it's very good at repeat clients because if a client has been with you and had a good experience with you, when their family grows and they have baby number two, three, I'm now on clients bringing baby number four to me, um, they will come back because they want a complimentary set to the first baby photos they had. And very few parents will have a 40 inch canvas on the wall of one baby, but not replicate that with each subsequent child because they know that they've got to be fair and even, um, otherwise they'll complain when they're older. And it is ideal for baby plans if you choose to do older babies. Um, currently, I don't. I do maternity and newborn, um, and I tend to leave it there. But if you do cake smashes or first birthday ones and carrying on, you can get them tied into it quite nicely. Lots of photographers do sitting sessions or six and nine month sessions. So it's a good way of pulling them in and keeping them in your studio and getting them to come back again and again. Um, so, attracting clients. This is a big one. People always say to me, how do you attract your clients? There's a multitude of ways and really you need to make sure you tap into lots of different streams. Don't just rely on only using Facebook or purely on Google. You need to tap into all of them. People need to see your brand. Is it seven, nine times? A lot of times before they'll start to recognize you as a strong brand. The more they see your brand in all these different places, the stronger an appearance that you as a company give. Um, so some of the sort of routes that I get my clients from, I actually get a lot of word of mouth. I live in quite a rural town in Lincolnshire, um, and I'm very well known here. I actually, I get known as the lady that the photographer that dances with the babies, because when I get them to sleep in the studio, I, I do tend to dance around with them. Um, and it's a little bit cheesy, but it works really well. And I, so rather than the baby whisperer, I get known as the dancing lady. Um, but it shows that People do talk to people, people listen, they'd rather go with someone that can recommend and had a good experience with them. It's stronger than booking somebody cold that they don't know about. Website and good SEO is really important. And one big thing just to point out to you all is we all go by the term newborn photographer, but most families having a baby wouldn't go and search for newborn photographers. They'll put in baby photos. Um, they use the word baby much more than newborn, so make sure you do your keywords, you cover both those things in there. Social media is huge. You've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. Instagram and Pinterest seems to be picking up more and more in terms of client bookings these days. I probably don't use everything as much as I should because um, I'm a little bit lazy, but also I've got quite a lot of clients booking in already. But I know that if my business went quieter, I use Facebook, but I pick up more on the Twitter and Instagram if I find my bookings dropped off of it. But again, it's using all of them, and there's lots of software that make it easy, like Hootsuite, to be able to do one post and it can share them between you. Um, but you kind of need to find out what the parents in your local areas use. In Lincolnshire, where I am, most people seem to be Facebook people. There aren't that many I know that use Twitter. Um, I've got friends in Liverpool who get lots of bookings through Instagram and Pinterest. So find out what the families near you are on, what your potential target market uses, and that's where you need to focus a bit more. There are options where you can buy leads from companies like um, Emma's Diary, and Click. There's lots of different companies that sell you leads. And a lot of those, it's not cold calling. It's where people have given permission to be um, approached by photographers. They want your information. So they can work really well for people as well. Business referrals. Um, I networked with a lot of local businesses, and we all mutually refer to each other. So you need to find businesses like your local 4D scan center, people that make um, 
baby nappies, the, the reusable nappies, baby slings, baby massage, baby yoga, baby swim classes, um, antenatal classes, antenatal yoga, anything where a client has to pay a little bit for that service tends to mean that they're a client with a bit of disposable income, so therefore they're going to fit your target client as well. Um, and what I've tried to do there is really make a relationship with those suppliers. So rather than just saying, let's do a mutual card swap, I find ways of getting to know them, we'll go for coffee together, and sometimes I'll do shoot headshots with them, and they'll do things for me. So it makes a referral more genuine rather than just a, here's a business card of somebody I know. You can talk about them by name, you can talk about what the class might be like, and it means when you get when they recommend you back, it's a much stronger recommendation. Um, and I think that's quite invaluable. So it's an, I think it's an important one to look at. As I said previously, I do get quite a lot of repeat customer now. And that's such a rewarding thing, because you know if a family's come back to you that you've done a good job in the first place. Um, so it's really it's quite humbling when they come back and they get all excited. And when you welcome them back, it's often my old friends by the time they come back, especially with my families who are now on baby number four. It's so nice to see them all grow as well. Um, maternity progression. If you do maternity photographs, that's another good way of getting newborns in. Um, and you can either do your, your booking separate or together for that. But I've only ever had one client in seven years do a maternity shoot and not follow on with a newborn. So virtually everybody who's had a maternity session comes back for a newborn one. And you've also got business directories. Um, I know that I'm in quite a few association, photography association, association directories, a local last one. Some you can pay for, some you don't, but you need to see, again, what your target client might use and which ones will rank well with Google and help your SEO by giving you a good link back to your site. Um, so any questions on those, Jay, while we're here? Well, the questions have been coming in, love, but they're, they're kind of generic and sort of a bit general, so we'll, we'll get a few of them out of the way. Uh, let's have a look. So, um, well... How do, how do you feel about, how do you price yourself competitively? Then you talked about, somebody mentioned that you talked about 45 photographers in your near area. So what what's your best advice to sort of pricing? Do you look at the other photographers and their price lists or would you just set your own? I think, I think you need to be aware of your other photographers in your area but not focus on them. Um, a little bit further on, I'll go over through a bit. But, um, I've got a few slides talking about how to differentiate yourself from your local clients. But I'm actually, as far as I know, I'm the most expensive photographer in my area by far. And I decided that rather than try, trying to compete on price, which is only ever going to be a downward spiral, I tried to make um, my studio a much higher end service and try and be as bespoke and special as I can. Um, so yes, you do need to be aware of what your competitors, who they are, what kind of style they offer, what kind of prices. But I don't think you need to put yourself on a par with their prices. You need to work out financially what you need to earn to survive and then work backwards. Does that make sense? Absolutely brilliant, yeah. And we do, you know, we, we've done exactly the same with our studios. It's the high end, it's the bespoke, it's making yourself stronger than anywhere else and gone in at the high end straight off the bat. So perfect sense. Um, do you need, and this is, I, I couldn't answer this if I wanted to, do you need any specifically special insurance for when doing newborn photography? Is there anything extra that you have to get? No, just regular public liability. And that covers you for it. Perfect. Um, you mentioned, obviously, that the, the, the main part of your business now is maternity and newborn. Obviously, you mentioned that your site was purely based at the newborn, but you said that you did some fine art nude and, and some dance photography. Would you then, would you think, I know that, you, I'm not sure that you do or you don't, but would you recommend then having a separate site for that if you, you know, if you're building a newborn business, is that all? That's what I've be? chosen to do. Um, I've chosen to go for two separate sites because I don't think Art Nude and Newborn necessarily go hand in hand with each other. Um, quite a different target market. Um, I do, however, have links, discrete links on my Art Nude site back to my maternity work and vice versa. And if people come to my studio, on the walls I have artwork from both the types of sessions. So often I'll get new mums come with their babies and go, oh, when I've got my figure back, I quite fancy treating myself to a new shoot or a celebration shoot that I've kind of got a bit of me time back again. So I don't hide it within my clients, but online, yes, I've gone for two separate brandings, two different business names, two different websites. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. I've just found that for me, it's the right way for me to do it. Brilliant. Uh, and with websites being more and more affordable these days, it's, it's probably the, 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 the way we would advise to go as well. Uh, definitely down that route. Brilliant. Um, 
Okay, so the, okay, actually a couple of questions came in and they're kind of the same really. Um, so how do you start to build a newborn portfolio when you're starting out? So how would you sort of recommend getting your sort of images together? And actually then the second question, which is from a different person, was how do I get my first newborn client? So sort of starting out advice really. Yeah, when you're starting out, my opinion is you need to do sort of model calls or practice sessions to portfolio build. And I'd only start charging a client when you consistently feel that you could give yeah, consistent results with every session that you do. So your work doesn't have to be exactly where you want to aspire to. My work is, and I still always want to improve it. But you need to be confident that when a client comes in, you can produce them at least, I don't know, 10, 15, however many images you want to say to them that you'll do. You need to be confident that you can do that. Um, so I would say do model calls. It doesn't necessarily need to be all over Facebook. It depends. But if you've got local baby and toddler groups near you, you could go pop in to those, explain that you're a new starting photographer, and would anybody like to come along and have some photographs taken? Um, and for me, any time I do something completely new or I want to try out new props, I tend to actually do it for free. I know people go, don't do work for free. But if I do a shoot with some new complicated prop I want to try out, the pressure is off slightly if I'm not charging them, or I might give X amount for free, because they're giving up their time for me. Um, if you start trying to take a lot of money from or your practice sessions, then you're already in business. And so I just think I kind of will say, hold fire. You might only need five babies under your belt before you're ready to go. You might need 10, you might need 15, you might need 20. We're all going to reach a point where we're confident at a different level. Um, but start simple and get the basic poses nailed. And when you feel confident with that, then I think you can get going. And then you can start to learn the more complicated work. Brilliant. Um, I'm just sort of scanning through the photo. Uh, the questions most of the questions are relating now to the photography so I'll hang on to them for a minute um, because we're getting on to that uh, let me just check um, do you do you share do you sorry do you have your price list on your website or do you wait for the actual client meeting um, I don't have it on my website but I do email it to them before booking I looked around at different options and um, I decided to go for starting prices so my session fee is on my website and I have starting prices for canvases and files on my website. I had a feeling if I put my full price list on my website, it would scare people off and they wouldn't even book. Because I'm aware that lots of my clients will spend more than they provisionally think they will when they come to me. I don't do hard sales, but when people see a picture of their babies, they get emotional, they find a bit more budget than they thought they had, and they tend to spend better. I also found that, um, but I do want to avoid sticker shock. So they all see prices before they book. Um, they all get a PDF with all my prices in them. I also found that if my prices aren't on the website, it makes them email me for a price list. And then I have um, a link and a connection and an opportunity in that one email to try and sell myself to them a bit more. So it was a very intentional choice not to. Um, again, no right, no wrong. It's what works for you and for your business. But for me, I just think most of my clients actually look at my prices and run a mile. Um, so I kind of need to make them fall in love with the images before they see the price list. Brilliant. Um, okay, so the last question before we... Uh, crack on because they are coming through thick and fast um, but you mentioned there about sort of putting it out there if you want to do a test shoot um, how, how do you sort of how do you get that out there how do you word that could it be seen as if you are an established photographer could it be seen as negative if you're looking for doing something for free or do you just do something is it on Facebook just you know calling all wanted photographers uh, how best you bring those sort of people in the way that I would normally do it myself is I'm a member of a lot of local Facebook groups for parents. Um, so there's one like called Laugh Mummies, for example. There's lots of small town groups. And that's where I'll put model calls in um, or ask for, you know, if I'm trying to experiment with something new, I'll put it in there. And I try as much as possible to avoid putting it on my business page. Because if you are an established business and you post a lot of free sessions on there, I think you risk a strong chance of upsetting your current clients that are paying you full prices. Um, so I think it's good to do shoots for yourself, it's good to practice or do new things, but I don't want to upset current clients who are paying me several hundred pounds for sessions by offering them free too frequently on that. So I try and do it in a more discreet way. Usually I actually ask around and find out friends of friends who've got babies. Um, they tend to be more reliable and definitely turn up that way as well. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to hang on to the questions that I've got for now because most of them are photography related so as we move on. But it's all back to you, love. Okay, thank you. So we looked at attracting clients. I mentioned about doing maternity. Um, and with maternity, I do think it's a really good way of pulling babies in. You can offer it as a separate shoot or a bump-to-baby package. 
the way I've ended up doing it is I sell both the session foods separately or they get a discount if they book them together. However, I do the actual session and the sales as very separate. So they come back for a maternity view and then they come back for a newborn view. And I found they spend a lot more if they see the maternity photos before they have the newborn session. Otherwise, they tend to get so wowed by the baby photos, they don't buy as much on the maternity. Uh, but it does increase your sales. And the other thing that I found with it as well is that um, when a client has a, well, I'll just bring these, the rest of the When a client has a baby and they, well, they come from a maternity session with you, you share a bit more in the journey of their baby with them. So you're there discussing, have they got names yet? Is it the first child? Have they got other children? Often they'll talk to me about their fears of labor or all sorts of random comments. You'll talk about what cravings they've had. So you build a friendship in that maternity session and you become part of their journey in having their baby. Then they come back and have their maternity viewing. Um, usually I try and get that before the newborn is born. Then when they bring the baby back, it's like you're welcoming an old friend back into the studio. You've already got the um, preliminaries out of the way. And it is lovely to meet the baby that was the bump that you photographed. It's really quite special. And I find those clients who come back when they've had a maternity are far more relaxed with me, which tends to help the session go better, tends to make it a better experience. And then usually they end up spending more on the newborn sales as well. So for me, doing maternity has been a really important part of offering this entire experience I'm trying to put together for my clients. And also, yeah, the early newborn booking. Most of my clients, when they book a maternity, book the newborn at the same time. And as a newborn photographer, one of your biggest challenges is getting the babies in early enough. On my website, I say up to two weeks old, but the reality is I'll do a newborn up to six weeks old. But if I put up to six weeks on my website, then people phone wanting you to do newborn photos with an eight week old, which is a whole different ball game. So if you put on your website sort of two to three weeks, if you can still pull off the magic with a four or five week old, which you can, they think you're wonderful. Um, but it tends to help your diary, get them getting touched and in contact with you quicker when they've had the baby to confirm dates if they think it's got to be under two weeks. Um, so by doing maternity sessions, you've already got them booked in before baby's even born. It just makes my whole diary much a much smoother process. So booking and parent prep. Um, because I'm trying to build a very high-end experience for my clients, the experience they receive starts before they book. So usually the first thing they'll see is my website or my Facebook page. And then usually it's an email because they then email me for a full price list. And with that, I email them back and I can attach my studio literature for them. So everything has to look high-end, classy, friendly and informative. It's your first and strongest shot at selling yourself to your clients. You also need to make sure you've got an ease of booking. So on your websites, on your Facebook pages, you need to use the call to action options. So have book now and have easy links where they can, whether you want them to book by phone or email or your contact form, make sure it's really easy for them to find their way around. Um, and the nice thing as well with some of the website booking, if you take online bookings, means often they'll book a session at two in the morning. They might wake up with uncomfortableness or leaving the toilet because they're pregnant and then they go on the internet and they're browsing. If it's easy for them to book when they've had your information, you've given them a link to pay with, most of my bookings probably come between the hours of sort of 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So it's often over the night, it's quite spontaneous, they'll just go and book there and then. So it make your life as easy as you can to get the bookings in. You need to prepare the parents for the session. I've got a slide in a moment I'll go through with you to show you what I say to them. But the more you can prepare the parents, the smoother your session is likely to go. Um, and the other thing with all the contacts you have with them, from your very first website to the first email or phone call if you do phone consultations, it's all about building the excitement. You need to get them all hyped up and excited so that they really look forward to the day and coming to see you. So for parent prep, I educate them on the best age. So I usually say ideally within the first two weeks and tell them why. Um, you want to get the curled up sleepy look. They tend to sleep a little bit longer when they're younger. They tend to be a bit more pliable and fold more. Often babies around three or four weeks might start getting baby acne, which makes your editing harder. So that's one of the reasons to get them in a bit younger. Equally, depending on how the baby's fed, um, depends on what age I bring them in as well. I've got no preference whether a baby is bottle fed or breastfed. doesn't make any odds there to me. But often with breastfed babies, the mum's milk doesn't fully kick in until about day six. So sometimes you've got, if you have a baby a lot younger than that, sometimes they're not getting a deep, full feed and they don't sleep as well. 
So if they're breastfed, I tend to wait till they're about six or eight days old. If they're bottle fed, I'll tend to do over four. I have done younger, I've done a two day old and a three day old. Um, and they work well, but the reality is there's no need to photograph a baby at day two or day three. So I don't try and do that often anymore. I think it's better for mum to have a bit of a rest before they come in. So usually over four days or over six if they're breastfed, I aim for. Um, and set expectations as well. Depending on what kind of newborn photography you do, um, if you do the frog pose and the hammocks and all sorts of fancy complicated composite shots, sometimes you need to let the parents know that what they're seeing on your website is your best of the best work. You can't always guarantee every baby will do every pose. Um, I always tell my parents the sessions are baby led and we'll work with what baby's comfortable with us doing. I tell them what to bring. Um, so all they need to bring usually, I get them to bring a blanket from home because if they bring something from home and baby gets unsettled, putting a blanket that smells of mum or dad on them will help settle them more than a spare sheer blanket that I might have. I ask them to bring whatever milk baby's on and extra. So if they're bottle fed, they need to bring a few more bottles than they think they might need because sometimes with the heat and with the comfort that the baby needs, they'll feed a little bit more frequently than they would if they were at home. And I ask them as well to bring a dummy. Um, and it's always a controversial one because lots of people are really anti-dummies. But for me, as a photographer, a dummy can save a session. Um, I will never force a dummy on a baby if the parents don't want them to have. A lot of my parents are breastfed clients that don't want the babies to have dummies, so we don't. Uh, but I ask them to bring one on the off chance because it, it, if baby is unsettled, it can just really help calm them. They never have to use it again after the session. I tell the parents to wear light layers because my studio gets quite warm. Um, so if they have layers, they can kind of take them off as we go. If your parents aren't comfortable, they'll be clock watching and irritable. So you need to have them all prepared and comfy so that they are relaxed when they're here with you. Time allowances as well. I ask them to um, put aside four hours for a newborn session. The reality is now I've got a studio based. I'm usually done inside of two. But there are times where you do get a baby that takes a bit longer to settle down. And so it's nice to know you've got that bit longer time if you need it. When I was mobile, it took a bit longer because you've got to set up and set down each time as well. Um, and actually, that's another point as well. If you are a mobile photographer and you go to their houses, just try and make sure they don't have a midwife um, or health visitor due to visit. Because there's nothing worse than having a baby just asleep, posed on a beanbag, and in comes the midwife who needs to weigh the baby. And medical needs priority, so you let them, but it sets you back ages. So just think ahead and just make them check they've got nobody coming around when your session's there. Um, and then we need to look at as well preparing the baby for the session because what they do with the baby makes a difference. So what I will usually ask them there to do is, if possible, keep the baby awake in the morning before the session and try and time it so they do a feed when they get to the studio. Um, I'm slightly rural, so quite a lot of my families drive to me, so I know babies will sleep in the car on the way here. But I want to get at my studio my end goal is to have a baby arrive who's tired and hungry. So we can strip them down to a nappy, wrap them in a blanket, give them a warm feed, and then they drop off. That's the goal. So the settings. So my studio is a lovely rural location. I've made a relaxing lounge area, um, lots of comfy seating for parents. And recently, I've even bought some pile cushions because new mums might have had tears or stitches. Um, it's not overly comfy sometimes sitting down for a long time. So anything you can think of that would help a new mum or dad relax and feel comfortable will help your session go better. I have a fully stocked baby station, so I provide nappies, wipes, baby wipes. Hopefully they bring their own and they use their own as well. But if they've forgotten anything, I try and make sure I've got it all in the studio. Um, I also have, um, I've got mother's needs provided for. So by that I have sanitary stuff, I have breast pads, I have, um, I have nipple creams for nursing mums. Again, anything that when they're new to leaving the house with the baby, that they might forget something they need. If they're going to be really uncomfortable for the full session, they're going, they're going to not relax. They're going to want to leave earlier. The baby won't relax as much if parents are relaxed. So try and cover all your bases where you can. I do provide refreshments for them because, again, if they're hungry or thirsty, um, they're not going to relax as much. And I also don't have a clock in my studio. Very intentionally, I've tried to hide the time from them. Most parents have got a phone, but I don't want a big ticking clock on the wall where they can go, oh, it's been 20 minutes and she's not taken a photograph yet. Um, so I try and keep it all very calm and nice in here. So cover all the senses. So it needs to look nice. It needs to feel nice. Your studio needs to smell nice. 
So do a fresh walk in every now and again and just think how does it feel for a stranger walking into your studio? And then you need to build a connection. So throughout the session, I'm chatting to the parents. I find out all about them. I usually, by the end of the session, know exactly where the parents met, how many children they've got, um, how they came out with the baby name, find out the birth story. Just ask and chat away all throughout, and then they will leave feeling more like a friend than a client, and that helps your whole business. It helps your sales. And it's also just a nicer experience for, for you as well as your clients. Um, so session flow. It's really important in your session, whether you're mobile or you have a studio, that you plan ahead. Babies aren't asleep for very long windows of time sometimes. So if you can plan exactly what you're going to try first, try next, try third, and have it set up ready, when that baby is asleep, if you successfully get them all in one prop or on the beanbag, then you've got the time, you can quickly move them to the next to the next without having to stop and reset up and think, right, what should we do next? So have a plan. If it helps you, write it down and have a written shoot list. You need a nice, calm environment. I do have music on in the background, but I always have just the whole studio. I've tried to make it home from home, so it's calm for the baby, calm for the parents as well. And I am very chilled and calm. If the parents get to me and they seem a bit nervous, and sometimes they are because it's a big financial commitment, I'm often their first visit out of the family home to take the baby anywhere. Um, there's a lot of anxiety and they want it to go well and they don't want their baby to be the one baby that cries all session. So when they're feeding their baby, I'll sit and have a tea or coffee with them and if they look all anxious, I'll sort of really relax my posture and people mirror people and you see them start to wind down and relax with you. Um, but if a mum, it's usually the mum who feeds and gets baby to sleep, especially a lot of my parents are nursing parents. But if mum or dad are tense and they're holding the baby, then their arms will be tense and the baby picks up on that. So the more relaxed you get the adult, the more relaxed the baby will be too. You need to have a productive use of time. Again, that's me saying that often um, in a session, I can often get it done within two windows of, say, 15 minutes will give me all the setups that I need. But if I wasted that time moving lights around, moving props around, changing backdrops, I'm going to use my baby sleep time without actually being productive in it. So plan ahead and think like that one. Flow posing. Um, know each time, every time you've got a baby down, whether it's on your beanbag or posing table or whatever you use, have in your head the pose you want to try first. Then while you're doing it, be aware of what you want to do next and third. And I've kind of come up with a flow where I know that my poses lead from one to another to another with minimal disturbance to the baby. And prop transitions as well. I have, If I'm going to do a few different props, I have them set up ready uh, with the furs and everything in them with wraps I might want to use next to it so that you can just move baby from one to the next to the next. So the next things I wanted to talk about was some tranquil tips and sleepy specifics, and then we'll do some more questions. Um, but this is the big ones that I always seem to get asked about. So people say, what's the magic secret to getting babies to sleep? And the answer, unfortunately, is there isn't really one, um, but there's lots of things you can do to help. So I have my studio quite warm. Um, I don't want to be sweaty in it, and you don't want a baby to sweat. But if you're going to undress a baby down to no clothing, it needs to be a lot warmer than a regular room temperature would be because they will lose body heat quite quickly. So I have it hot. Um, I also, though, have a fan heater on them because it's the breeze of the fan heater that helps settle them and keep them kind of calm. It's the actual movement of warm air going across the body that makes them feel comforted. Lots of milk. I want my babies to be really full. It's a bit like when you're aiming for, um, if you have a big Christmas dinner or a big Sunday roast, you overeat and you sit in a chair and you get really tired afterwards. That's what we want for babies. We call it milky drunk. I want them to have so much milk and be really tired that they just pass out and let us work our magic with them. I have white noise in the studio. Um, I've used various things, apps that have been free on iPhones and iPads. I currently use a device called the Baby Shusher, which is a lovely little white noise shushing thing. It's about £25 on Amazon. But I think it looks more professional than having a phone next to a baby. And if you need your phone on for any reason, you don't want it to buzz or text when you've got a baby asleep next to it. So I've opted to buy a separate device for it. Um, and babies need contact. They're not usually used to being just put down on a beanbag or in a Moses basket and left to sleep. They've been in touch with the mother's body the whole time. They've been carried for the nine months. Then they're born and they get passed from parent to parent, usually falling asleep on people's chests and things. So they're used to people. They're not really used to being left. So often when I lie them on the beanbag initially, I keep my hands on them and keep a lot of contact on them. Um, 
And when you're trying to get them to sleep, I do a lot of movement, so lots of rocking, lots of jigging, lots of bouncing, because they are used to being walked around inside mum's tummy and then carried and rocked around afterwards. So keep the movement going to get them to sleep. Um, and another thing that I recommend is I try and avoid perfume or aftershave. And there's three reasons for that. One is that some babies are actually allergic to perfume, and most ladies put it on their wrists, and then you put your hands under the baby, so it's direct contact on the skin. But the bigger reason, I suppose, from a photographer's point of view, is I want to be really boring for that baby, and if I smell of a strong scent, it's going to alert them more, and they'll be awake and trying to figure out who you are and why you smell different. So I avoid perfume for that reason. And my third reason was just I remember when I had my own children, um, people would pass them around a room, and often, no offence, but it was the old the old lady perfumes, the baby would come back smelling really strong of something else, and it just used to kind of get my back up a bit. So out of respect for parents, I try not to change the smell of their baby either. Um, but probably the big safety one is because some are allergic to it, we'll go with that one. But the main benefit I found was it doesn't disturb them when they're you try to get them to sleep. So to get them to sleep, what we need to do is overlay the senses. So I need to make sure that I'm moving them around and I will do quite big swingy sways or have them over my shoulder and bounce up and down. The more movement, the better. Um, sound, I have the music on in the studio, I chat with the parents, I have white noise on. A quiet studio would be my worst nightmare. And if you go to people's houses and you're a mobile photographer, often they'll invite you in and they'll walk over and turn the television off. And I was going, no, no, put the TV back on. If you're used to having it on, leave it on. The more noise, the better. Um, it stops any kind of, you drop something or your camera shutter or just when you chat to the parents, babies less likely to start and if they're used to having noise around them. And touch. Babies are used to being held and touched. And another thing that I like to do is I like to run my hand from their forehead down their nose and it encourages them to close their eyes as you're gently kind of pushing them shut every time you stroke downwards. You need to avoid the cheeks, chin, nose area because they'll start rooting for food if you go near the mouth. And the last one is just secure. After when I get babies to sleep, I have them sort of swaddled or wrapped in their own blanket from home. And I tuck their arms in because if babies' arms are out, they flail them around more. If I can wrap them up and tuck them inside and hold them secure, they're more likely to trust you and go to sleep there as well. Um, and sleep cycles. Babies have a uh, about a 50 minute sleep cycle and it goes between deep sleep and then active sleep. Um, REM or dream sleep is your active sleep and it's in that active sleep you'll see them, the eyes twitch, you might get little smiles, often you can see their eyelids kind of, their eyes moving in the eyelids, their eyelids flutter a bit and they'll pull all sorts of faces. That's the lightest form of sleep and if you try and pose a baby in the active sleep bit you're more likely to wake them up. So you need to just wait it out for the deep sleep. And to know when the deeper asleep, usually just go off their breathing. It gets a lot slower and steadier and deeper in the tummies. Um, or you can do the, the arm test where if you hold an arm up, it sort of flops back down again. That's the time, that's the magic time you want to be posing and moving them around there. If the baby's in a pose and they've gone from the deep sleep back to the lighter active sleep, just keep your camera ready because that's the time when you might catch the smiles. They'll often do facial expressions and you might catch a big grin or a lovely lip pout there. Um, and let's just have a little look at... I was going to go on to baby safety, Jay, but are there any questions on that we want to ask before I move on? There are a load of questions. So if we, if we get, let's get some out of the way and then we won't be uh, stumped with all of them right at the end. Um, so you, you've, well, we've not gone into any uh, into any depth but obviously you know you're using props and you're saying have them all prepped uh, with regards to outfits is that purely the parents and the baby's own outfits or do you actually have some of your outfits of your own as well um, I provide everything at my studio because I think they book me on my style and my taste and um, so I try and avoid the parents bringing things in some photographers encourage, encourage it and that's absolutely fine too but any of the outfits the dungaree sets hats headbands wraps they're all mine and I make sure then it complements the kind of props and the backdrops that I use. Brilliant. Um, obviously, you've talked in depth now about when you started out. Obviously, you were mobile because a few questions came in saying, is it easier to work from studio or is it as hard to work from, uh, you know, mobily? Obviously, you can work mobile. And I think the key point you said was, was allowing yourself more time. Is it more prep if you're going out to do the job? Yeah, it takes longer to set up and set down, especially if you use studio lights. Sometimes you need to call before you can pack them away. 
Um, studio is a thousand times easier. It's your environment, you control it, you have it all set up where you want to. Um, and I would hopefully never have to go back to mobile again because I just love having everything where I want it. But mobile is great because it's convenient for parents. So if you are mobile, don't be put off by that. You use that as a selling point that they can stay at home in their pajamas and you tip up and bring everything. The downside as well being mobile is you often have very tight space. You don't always know what space or light or parking nearby will be. Brilliant. Um, I don't know if we were going to touch on it in this one. Obviously, we've touched on it on the films that we've made, but what type of lighting are you using, Ellie, in the studio? Um, I'm currently using Bowen's lighting, and what I've gone for is really, really big softboxes. Um, the softbox, I think, is almost more important than the, the flash head itself. Um, for my newborns, I use a, a 1 meter 50 indirect octobox, and it gives a really beautiful big soft light. It's the closest I could find to replicate window light. Um, and then for my prop shots, I use a square, 100 meter square softbox with um, an egg crate on it, just to kind of control the spill of the light more. Because I don't want that light to flow all around the room, because it would light my brown wood too much. Excellent. But the larger the light source, the better, is my tip there. Cool. Um, just going back to sort of the business side of things we were talking about earlier, um, I think you actually mentioned it uh, in, in your presentation, but somebody asked whether you do online sales or face-to-face -face sales. I think the key there is face-to-face, -face, right? Yes. I, I don't know if I'll get through all my slides or not, actually, but I've got a slide on, on the, the sales and how I do that normally. Um, but I say face-to-face -face because when I swap from online to um, in-person sales, I found my sales went up by sort of uh, they tripled, like literally tripled. And I had some feedback from a client who had both experiences with me, and they said, while online sounds nice, they were lost and they had no idea what to order, what sizes things were. So I found that doing an in-person viewing, it completes that whole experience. You guide them through the products that you've got, you help them choose the images that they want, and it kind of finalizes the whole service. Exactly. I think as well, you need to, you need to show big as well. And the reality is if you send an, an email link out to a gallery online, most people will end up viewing it, going around Tesco's with a screaming toddler and a hungry newborn looking at it on a mobile phone screen. They won't wait till they get home to see it on a big screen. So all the work you do gets seen on an iPhone maybe. And I just think that's um, it's a shame and a big loss of a wow factor, whereas if they can come and see it on a big projector or a big screen, it's so much more impressive for them. I absolutely agree, 100%. That's how we work, and so completely the same on that. Um, I, I'm sure the answer to the question is yes, but do you take payment by credit card? Yes, yes, you absolutely need to. Um, I would never make anywhere near the sales I'd do if I didn't. Um, I didn't want to go down the offering credit option, but if they want to pay on credit card, sort out themselves. Yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. Brilliant. Um, just selling uh, prints and albums, or do you do any kind of digital sales? No, I do digital as well. I have no problem selling digital because I think I would want the files if I booked a session with somebody. However, you price them high and you're aware that once they're out there, they can do what they like with them. Um, but most of the packages I've, or collections I've put together actually include um, wall art and digital together. Don't be put off thinking if people buy digital, they will never buy wall art. I sell large canvases to most of my clients and I refer to the digitals as a backup. So from the heads from the beginning, they kind of have the expectation they're probably going to buy both things. Brilliant. Uh, this this question came through uh, quite a few times, actually, Ali. Um, would you, so I'm just going to answer it, ask it the once, uh, but obviously we've had a few people ask it. Would you say the area of photography is better suited to female photographers, or can a male photographer be as successful in this field? Male photographers can be incredibly successful in this field. There are over a dozen really, really good strong men that I would adore to photograph my babies if I'd known about them when I had my children. Um, I don't think it makes any odds what sex you are. It doesn't also make any odds if you're a parent or not. It really doesn't come into it. It's how well you interact with the families, how well you handle the babies. That's all it comes down to. Brilliant. Um, okay. Any, uh... I, uh, somebody's asked, they, they found that Studio Flash disturbs the babies. Any advice on this? Are you using flash or constant lighting? I use flash, but it's on its softest, lowest power you can possibly get, and it's very well diffused, and then it's feathered away from the baby as well. So you're never putting a blinding flashlight near a baby. Um, but I'd also say I've never, ever had a baby bothered by flash. So just make sure that you're using as soft as you can. You can use ND filters on the flash if it doesn't go as low as you want it to. Um, and then feather your light away. That way you'll get the nice soft light falling on the baby anyway, which is kind of what we usually prefer. 
but no, no, no experience of babies being bothered by flash there. Brilliant. Uh, okay, uh, let me just make sure I've missed. Um, oh, this was interesting, actually. I was going to hang on to it, but let's, we'll ask it now, because obviously you mentioned earlier that the fields that you do are newborn and maternity, and obviously, um, do you find it difficult then um, if they're asking you about their family shooter because it's something that you don't do? Do you find that that affects possible future bookings? Um. Not really. Um, there are photographers locally that I'm confident that I well that I feel comfortable recommending clients to if they want sort of family shots and outdoor shots as baby grows. I will do some parent shots in a newborn session if that's what they want. Um, there is always the chance, knowing that I don't do cake smashes and things at present, that I might lose some clients to photographers who do that and also offer newborn. But for now, I'm getting a lot of bookings through, so I don't need to worry overly. It's something I might revisit in the future if it became an issue. But I think being a specialist in a field has kind of helped me out of that. Excellent. Uh, I think I'm going to let you carry on because a few things now are talking about sort of the, gen the general stuff again that we'll do in the question section. So, uh, yeah, it's all back to you, Lefano. Okay, thank you. So, baby safety then. Um, composites, really important. If you're not sure what a composite is, you take, if you've got a baby balanced in a, in a hammock or a, a frog pose or there's various anything that looks like how they've done that with the baby, it doesn't look natural, it will be held. You take two different photographs and you Photoshop them together. Um, so anything that you do where a baby needs some support, make sure it's done as a composite way. There's masses online to show you how to do that. And if you go on YouTube, there's all sorts out there as well. If in doubt about a shot, a shot and its safety, don't do it. Don't try it till you know. Um, I always use spotters. I tend to work alone in the studio on a, on a shoot, but I'll get the parents to spot. So any of the shots you see where the baby is in a prop and I'm further than arm's reach from them, mum or dad is kneeled right next to the baby with their hands just over them. So if the baby moves at all, the parents are there safe with them. Avoid heights as much as you can. Um, anytime I did like hammock shots and slingshots, the baby was always directly over a beanbag or something soft and the parents are there to support. Um, I do now work on a table to pose babies with, but it's a very large wide table and I'm always within arm's reach of them. I never step away from where the baby is. However sleepy a baby is, don't be fooled, they can move at any point. So avoid heights where you can and always have spotters if there is any risk to anything. And uh, this might sound really obvious, but try and avoid breakables. I've seen a craze for babies in glass jars and I just think um, I'd never risk that. It's just, if you break, it's just too too unpleasant to think about. So there's enough props out there that are plastic, resin, wood, solid. Just be sensible with the choice of what you put babies in. And uh, my lovely friend Sally Slacks let me borrow this shot to show you because um, I don't tend to photograph the frog anymore. I've gone for a lot more natural looking images in my work. But this is a, a gorgeous shot and Sally's showing you how she's done the holding the hands at the bottom, you hold the head at the top and then you photoshop it together. So the baby's never left alone at any point. So that was just to give you an example of a composite there for you. Uh, and then as we go on to the view and the modeling, we've kind of talked about, so I do do them in person, it's another shared experience. One thing as well that helps is you can reminisce over moments. Do you remember I said at the beginning about it's all about creating the high-end experience? In a session, um, I will make notes of what happened in the session. So if the baby weed on dad or the core clip fell out or something funny happened, make sure you write it down somewhere, then you can review it before the parents come in. And as the image comes on the big screen, you know, look, that was just before his core clip fell off, and look, there's one without it. And it, it makes it more special to them, it reminds them of the lovely time they had, and that you know their baby, even if you're having to cheat a bit and use notes to remember it with. Gives you more baby cuddles, which I genuinely do love, um, I think it's quite nice for the parents to see that you're interested in the baby, even without your camera in your hand. It makes it more that you are a genuine baby person, and not just a photographer after their money. Um, and it gives you the chance to give them guided choices. So, you know, what room do they want wall art in? Would they want it black and white or colour in that room? Which works best for them? Um, you can kind of talk them through. And I do feel it completes the service. If you do an in-person sale session, you've taken them from booking through the session to the viewing. You've held the hand the whole way through. Um, Presentation-wise, everything I try and do is um, high-end. So high-end packaging, making it consistent with my branding. And you need to make them feel valued after payment. So once it pays, you don't then lessen or cheapen the end product by sticking it in some rubbish packaging. Try and keep it all really nice. Like when you open a nice gift or a nice jewelry box, it's got ribbons and it's got soft fabrics, whatever you choose to use, it helps them still feel valued, I think. 
and it creates a good last impression too. Um, and also follow up. So either drop them an email or a phone call or have some return card that you can get them to fill in to let you know how it went. And if you follow up, that's when you tend to get a good reviews or testimonials that you can use on your website and your, um, your literature as well. So I know we've not got much time left, but what I wanted to just summarise with was um, unique selling points. More that is more important than ever. You need to have something that sets you out from the crowd, from the competition, because as I said, there is a huge amount of babies out there. There's also a lot of competition. So you just need to find a way of speaking to your clients direct and letting them know what you can offer. So you need to consider your style, the products that you offer, and the experience. If you don't have any USP, all that you can compete on is price, and that only ever goes one way, downward spiral. So you need to find something that makes you stand out. So if we looked at style, you need to differentiate yourself. There are some incredibly good photographers in my area, some lovely um, photographers. And what we've all tried to do is have a look that's slightly different to each other, because otherwise, again, the clients, if we all offered the same colours, the same textures, the same props, the clients will just book you on price. So have a look that's different to you. Um, and I do invest in props. I think sometimes the nicer props I've got that do cost a bit more money, they photograph better sometimes. The hats that are made out of mohair are a lot nicer than the, the cheap itchy wool, and they feel softer for the baby as the fabric photographs better. So you don't necessarily need to go and buy hundreds of props, but I would always say go for good value props that you can use again and again. Products. Um, try and find something that's different, maybe something that's bespoke. The album box you can see behind the portfolio box, um, a friend makes them for me. He's a, a furniture maker, and we designed an album box because I wanted something that was a little bit different to something that my locals could offer. Um, I put together collections of the products that I want to sell, so it kind of guides the clients to buy what I want them to buy. Complementary products and services. So all my products kind of fit together, and it all matches the style. So the wood of my products is the same as the wood in my studio, as the wood on the photos. It all looks like a coherent whole when they get the work back. Keep it in line with your branding. And professional, everything just needs to look really high-end and luxurious. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, the experience. This is the key bit, really. Um, I won't read all of these out, but this is just some feedback from clients. And all the things they say, like, we love the photos, but thank you for your patience and kindness to mum and dad. Uh, so relaxed in your presence. In fact, this one was a nice one, because I was saying if they hadn't felt so relaxed, the photos wouldn't have been as good. So again, it's the experience they're raving about, not as much the photography. I'm hoping they like it, but again, your warm, encouraging, friendly, welcome and manner, the whole process has been a delight for us. It's the experience that you sell that will make people spend more. The better the experience, the better the sales will be. I've just got endless quotes like that. So, how can you make your client, it's how you make your clients feel. Um, it's the memories you make together, the experiences that you share together, and it's more than just the images you create. So, it's making that whole experience really special, and in some ways, the photography is almost secondary. Because providing your work's a nice level, they're going to book you anyway. They will love whatever photos you take because it's their baby. They're going to be biased. So the better the experience is, the more they'll spend overall. And my last slide for you then is how can you create an exceptional experience? It's all the small little things. Um, having maybe a welcome board. Give them insider's tips. I teach them how to massage their baby. I can, I've a qualified breastfeeding counsellor, so if they're feeding them, we'll talk about nursing. Um, give them tips on the white noise app that you have and how it might help them. Get to know them. Do personalised things. So when I send them their order out, it goes with a handwritten thank you note. And remember them. Cheat if you need to. I use a light blue software and in there I write down how the parents have their drinks, anything funny that happened in the session, what jobs they do, names of siblings. So when they come back for a sales session, um, or the next time you meet them, or when they get back in touch in two years' time with baby number three on the way, you can look and go, oh, how are Johnny and Sophie doing? Because you've looked up the names. You're not going to remember all your clients. But they don't need to know that. They will just know they've had a great experience with you. Um, so I'm hoping that's all been helpful for you. Lots of questions have been good. I'm happy to take more if we've got time. And just to let you know as well that I do offer one-to-one -one mentoring. Um, I do mentoring on both maternity, newborn, and business. But the mentoring with babies, it's really hands-on. So I try as much as possible to get you to do the posing, you to do all the taking the shots and looking at the angles so that when you go away, you can replicate it rather than just leaving with a, a good portfolio of shots. I want you to have the skills that you can do it yourself. So there's lots more information on my website, minimemories.co.uk forward slash courses. And um, Jay's going to send you all the discount code for 10% off all my training courses for a year as well. 
So, any questions, Joe? Oh yes, I hope you're sat down and ready for them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We're um, obviously um, we're happy to uh, to to run over. We'll run over a bit. You're okay to stay with us, Ellie. Love you. Absolutely. Excellent. Before I forget, obviously Ellie is our newborn uh, photography master on the Photography Academy. She's already made her first fantastic series of film for us, which is available for you to watch. Which will have a lot of sort of the questions with regards to shooting and posing and lighting and backgrounds and everything. But uh, I'm going to ask you all these questions, Ellie. Love. So they're not in any particular order. I'm sorry. So I'm just literally mm -hmm. going from to the top to the bottom. Um, obviously, you've mentioned and we've seen obviously some examples of props. Obviously, this could be quite expensive when starting out. So what's the key advice uh, for you know, the first kind of props to buy? Buy a few. You don't need a lot at all. Um, start off with maybe three blankets because one baby could peel, peel on three in a session and one prop, maybe two at the most. General rule of thumb with wooden bowls and props and things is if you can put your wrist to your elbow in it, you can fit a baby in it. So you can just walk around putting your hand in and see if you can fit a baby into it. But start small and that way as well. When you find your style, and then you can you buy more of the right things. Sometimes when you first start out, you buy all sorts and don't use most of it because you decide actually it's not the look that you want. So um, you don't need to have a lot. Um, and if you go for more kind of, if you went for more creamy or neutral blankets, you can mix it and add colours with different wraps or headbands. It's a cheap way of doing it and having lots of different colour blankets. Uh, best place to to buy the sort of baby props, or where do you you know where do you look for them in the UK? Um, all over the place. Um, I like the trench bowls from Click Pops. They are actually my probably favourite go-to props. I will give them a plug there. They're resin and they're lightweight, so if you're mobile as well, they're easy to carry around and babies don't get splinters from them. Um, blankets I get from all sorts. I use Click and Sally Slack. A photography does some great backdrops, but also TK Maxx and Asda's and Sainsbury's and places like that. Um, all you want to do is try and get things that are more natural and less polyester nylon because they tend to have a bit of a shine, which isn't so good with backdrop creases. Excellent. Um, a few of the tacky questions to get out of the way. Um, what type of camera do you use, Ellie Love? I use Fuji. Absolutely love my Fuji camera. I used to be Nikon. Love Nikon too. I'm not camera brandist, but I swapped to Fuji because it's mirrorless, it's tiny and lightweight, and I can shoot overhead of the baby using the tilt screen. It's all on the videos actually why I use the Fuji, but I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Um, but yeah, nice and lightweight. Excellent. Uh, we've talked about the lighting, so obviously you favour the studio flash and why, so we've done that one, that's fine. Um, okay, we've asked a lot about the basic props, we've just talked about that. Uh, a choice of lens, do you have a specific lens favourite? What sort did you go for? I either, yeah, I either use my 16 to 55 which is actually a kind of 24-70 equivalent of a full frame, or I use my 35 which is a 50mm equivalent. And I mix and match because I get I just find work gets a bit boring if I use the same lens, so I just change it depending on what mood I'm on. But basically the lens has to be um, a working distance where when the baby is in a pose on the beanbag or the table, whatever you're posing them on, that you can reach them with your hand. So you can't use a long lens with a baby on a beanbag unless you've always got a spotter or an assistant with you. That's Brilliant. the key there. Keeping the baby safe kind of controls your, your lens choice. Excellent. Um, I think I think you've covered this, but maybe uh, and the question came in quite early, so let's just check it again. The parents they're in the studio with you while you're shooting. They are, but they're very out the way. Um, I've got a giant studio. Um, I'm actually just expanding it, so it's all going to change, and I've got a second shooting room coming along. But what I try and do is have my parents in the room because it's a lovely experience for them. But they're sat on a sofa in the corner, way out the way, so that once they're in and babies kind of had their feed, I take over. Um, and as much as possible, I don't mind the parents coming and looking and enjoying it, but I don't want them near the baby because they're more likely to wake up if the parents are near them. Um, so I kind of take control and need it all. If baby wakes, I'm the one that settles them back down again, um, unless they need a feed, in which case if they're breastfed, they go back to mum. If they're bottle fed, usually I'll say, oh, am I allowed to feed them? And I get to feed them as well. So. Brilliant. Um, the sales sessions, the the input, the, you know, the face-to-face -face sales sessions, How typically how long are they, would you say? Um, I allow an hour. I'm getting shorter at doing them. They're usually 35, uh, yeah, 35 to 45 minutes usually. But I don't want them to feel rushed, and I do kind of get baby cuddles and we have hot drinks and we chat and you know. Um, but when I first started, them, they probably took an hour and a half. So it took me some practice to get quicker at it. Um, but I think about half an hour to an hour is, is ample time. You don't want to go over that because they start getting bored then. 
Brilliant. Um, okay, this is quite interesting. We obviously we answered the, the question earlier about several people asked the question about you know uh, males being as successful as females. Um, do you think uh, if you're not a parent, you can still be a, a good uh, newborn photographer? Absolutely. I've trained so many photographers that aren't parents. Um, not necessarily young people. Either. There's people who've chosen for whatever reasons not to have children. It makes no odds if you're a parent. When you first hold somebody else's newborn baby, it's still incredibly nerve-wracking. It's someone else's child that you're responsible for. And every baby is so different that I've had three of my own and I've learned to read mine, but it doesn't mean somebody else's baby will react in the same way. So I think the big thing to do is, regardless of whether you've had any children or not, to be a good newborn photographer, one, you need to genuinely like babies at least a little bit. Um, and then you need to spend as much time as you can with babies ideally without a camera, so that you're not feeling the pressure of taking photos, but you're learning to read them. So babies have so many different crying cues and different ways of getting wind out. They give you lots of hints, but you can only figure out babies when you've kind of been around them for a long time. So it does get easier the more shoots you do, but initially if you can go along and help out baby and toddler groups and just make teas and coffees and offer to hold babies while the parents have a hot drink, you can use that time to kind of learn how to soothe different babies, learn what the different crying cues mean, and all that will help you massively in your photo shoots. Brilliant. Um, so this is another question for somebody starting out. Would you say, um, with regards to the products that you sell, are uh, wall art or albums the most popular? Which which two would you concentrate on, do you think? Um, right. Wall art, because I don't sell albums. Um, I sell portfolio boxes. Time is money. Um, I don't know whether, I'm a little bit lazy or I like to streamline things and I found that every time I sold an album inside I kind of died a little bit, oh I've got to go design it and order it and plan it. So I just took them off my price list, swapped it for a portfolio, um, I call it an album but it's a portfolio box which just has matted prints in it and it's made my whole workflow so much easier. So all I currently offer are um, mounted prints, a portfolio box with mounted prints in it, um, canvases for wall art and then digital files. I am looking at adding in one more higher end option to canvases, but that's it. I found when I offered lots of different products, it confused clients and I found the less I offered, the more they spent. So it's also finding products that you love. So if I hated selling albums, I just stopped selling them. I adore the large canvases, they look stunning. And there's nothing better than seeing you work in a 40 or 60 inch canvas arrive. Um, and I think that your whatever you're passionate about with your products comes across to your clients. So because I love my canvases, I sell lots and lots of them. If you love albums, you'll sell lots of albums. It just depends what you like. And just to throw in there as well, with maternity, don't think that people will only buy small albums to be hidden away. I sell so many large canvases of maternity shots. Um, often they might put them in the bedrooms, but don't think because it's maternity they only want small because they often will take a big product. Brilliant. Um, guys, uh, I, I am going to ask you please to stop asking questions because we've still got a load to, to ask, Ellie, and I promise the people that we will ask what we have, but uh, please, this, I've got, you know, normally we would say please stay on, but we're here all night. Loads of content from Ellie on the site, and we can obviously arrange another webinar, but I will ask all the questions that we have, but please, please, I'm going to have to ask you to stop now. So all the questions that are in will be asked. Sorry, Ellie, but otherwise, I don't think either of us are going home otherwise on that. Uh, so we've answered that one. That's fine. Um, I think this is a good one that people should go and look at the films for, but people were asking about the sort of studio setup, but I know we haven't really covered that tonight. So I, I think, because I've obviously been privy to some of the film, but you kind of set up, is it different set areas? So people were asking about floor, flooring and backgrounds and things like that. So is that, that the best way to go? If you've got the space? If you've got the space, have as many setups as you can, because I've now got space for, I've got my posing area, um, which was a beanbag on the videos. I've actually just switched it to a table. So um, Jay and I just said we might do a little top-up video on that to show you that one soon. But it works in the same way. And then I have a, a wood backdrop area, a white wood, like a dark wood, a white wood. I've got paper rolls. And then I've got some really nice click, make minor double ones where the floor blends into the backdrop as well of the wall. So I've got four or five different shooting areas that I could use. Um, it's kind of overkill, but I've got over 2,000 square foot studio now. But even if your studio is a bit smaller than that, you can usually still fit a backdrop area with your, your vinyls or whatever kind of wood you've got, and then a, a beanbag one. So you can move the baby from the beanbag to a prop as quick and easy as you can. If you can fit a second paper roll or another backdrop in there, go for that as well. 
um, anything to make your life easier, get the most out of that small sleep window. Excellent. Um, so, okay, we haven't actually talked about this, so a couple of questions on sort of the post process. How long would you say a shoot takes to edit, Ellie? Um, I've actually just taken on an editor who outsource, I outsource my editing to now, but when I do it, usually between an hour to two hours. Two hours absolute maximum, though, for a session. Um, I only show parents 20 to 25 images, so I aim to kind of do a two-minute edit an image and uh, batch edit in Lightroom as much as I can. Any preferred, okay. and sorry, you carry on, sorry. I was going to say, time is money, so you've got to streamline everything, otherwise you're just going to end up, you know, you're going to eat into your cost too much if you spend too long editing. Uh, so that led, led to the next couple of questions that came through. Do you use anything particular? Are you using filters or any sort of uh, plugins for, for Lightroom to speed up the process? Um, as much as I can, it's clean edits. If you get your lighting right, there's very little you need to do to a good image. From the sock to the final, there's really not a lot I do to them. Um, but if you don't get your lighting right, then you're rescuing it and fixing it. So lighting is absolutely key to your editing. Um, I batch edit in Lightroom, run a few things with Photoshop through. Um, I do use some actions, but they're ones that have been created in-house, not kind of bought, purchased ones. Because I think you need to know exactly what you, what actions or presets you're doing. What, you need to know how they're affecting the image. Sometimes they add noise in without you knowing, or they can have banding in. So I like to kind of be in charge of it all, really. Um, again, editing is something I do teach on my training. If anyone wants more info on that, just let me know. Brilliant. Um, actually, this, this came through a couple of times because we've talked about it, and obviously I can answer the question, but I want you to answer it. Do uh, you know? Because you mentioned 40 to 60 inch canvases, you know, and, and the question was, are people really buying that size of, of wall art, and, and what sort of sizes are the most common? But um, my most you're... popular size is a 36 by 24 inch canvas. That's the big. That's kind of the, the main one that I sell. Um, I sell 60 inch ones occasionally, not a huge amount, but you need to have, well, you need to show big to sell big and you always need something a little bit bigger than your main one that you sell. So I've got, in my viewing room, I've got some 60 inch ones which people love, but then they tend to go a size down and I shoot 12, 8 and tend to keep it in that ratio. So it's usually the 36 by 24 inch cameras. But a lot of my clients buy two. They'll often buy one of the baby on their own and then one of the baby and a sibling or baby and parents. Um, so yeah, they will often buy two large canvases from me. Brilliant, and that's uh, exactly the same here. We've got 60 inches on the walls and the averages are 30 by 20 and and, the, and towards the 40 inch print. So um, yes, the answer to the question is yes, they do buy big wall art. So, um, and definitely the way to go, brilliant. Yeah. As long as you get set out, if in your head you presume they're going to buy big, they usually will. Like you have to always put that thought into their head. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you use any kind of referral system, referral cards or anything like that, Liv? Um, I don't currently because I um, get quite fully booked and often have to have like a wait list now. But I did when I started out, and if my work bookings drop off, I would again. There's a multitude of options. I used to give. Um, I used to give them a free print from a session if they had a friend that booked because I didn't do follow-on sessions so much. If you do cake smashes, you might offer something towards that session if they have friends that book. Um, some people give out Costa coffee cards to people who've referred friends. Well, it's up to you to find what you want to do. But I'd also say look out for clients that advocate you. I have a couple of clients who sent me 10, 12 friends my way. And when they came back for their second baby photos, I gifted both of them a large canvas as a thank you didn't cost me very much, but for them it's like hundreds and hundreds of pounds worth of a product. Um, I don't kind of put on my website if you send 15 people my way, but if you find someone who really roots for you, reward them and then they'll keep doing it more and more. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, so it was quite nice that you uh, sort of shared and the importance of it as well, the sort of feedback that you have from your customers. Um, what's the easiest way to get the feedback or are you just actually happy to ask for it? I've only recently started asking. I never used to. It used to just be thank you emails that I get through. And then I thought, actually, um, it makes sense to ask. So what I do now is um, I check, I get in touch to check they receive their order okay. And that's usually when they'll gush at you. Uh, so I did phone sometimes, but I actually found if I emailed them to check they'd received all their order, they were happy with everything, then they reply back in a written form, then I can use that directly as a testimonial. Brilliant, because it's a great thing for social media as well as your website and everything like that these days, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Um, with referrals as well, sometimes you can say if they get so many likes on a photo or so many comments on a photo you post on Facebook, you can give them something in exchange that gets more traffic through. Um, Excellent. Do that way as well. 
Right. So obviously, I think you've mentioned it, and a couple of people have asked. Obviously, we've talked about sort of you've, what you've talked about now in detail about what you do actually offer as products. That's all available for the client to see at the session stage at the studio. Yes, at the session and at the viewing, and it's really important if you can to put it in the client's hands. So I try, I pass them the products and get them to hold it because touch is a, a big sense that gets overlooked a lot of the time. Brilliant. Um, somebody's asked, and I think they've kind of answered the question themselves. They only have a very small, what they call a shed uh, studio, and obviously very difficult for them to do the sort of the luxurious ambience. So in that respect, would you advise that they sort of get mobile to get started? No, I don't think space is a concern. Whether you're mobile or have a small shed or a large studio, it's still on how you dress, how you talk to your clients, how you um, have your props stored and organised. And I've, I've tried to make everything look ni neat and nice and kind of uh, controlled in the studio, but when I was mobile, rather than taking things in carrier bags, I bought nice boxes and took them in nice boxes. If you've got a small shed, it's also fine, but maybe hang your hats and wraps on the wall. It can still be homely. Um, one thing I struggled with in my studio is actually my main shooting room is almost too big to be cosy. So I'm now taking on, I've taken on some more room, so I'm going to be having a slightly smaller newborn studio because I think it will have a more homely feel than my massive large one. Um, so sometimes space isn't always as important as you think it is. Uh, brilliant. Okay. Uh, okay. So I know the answer to this, but as obviously somebody said, you mentioned about the software that you used to make your notes. That was light blue, is that right? Yeah, Light Blue is a, uh, a studio management, so it does my accounts, it does my calendars, it can do your emailing, it's a whole, go Google it because it's really worth looking into, I think. Yeah, we've got loads of film on Light Blue on the site, actually, because we've done a lot of work with them in the past, so if, if you are an Academy member, you can go and check out uh, the Light Blue videos, it's a fantastic bit of uh, photographer management software out there. Um, obviously, you mentioned about credit cards, uh, any recommendations on the credit card providers out there, or who do you use? Um, I use WorldPay at the moment. I did use payments as I had the proper standalone chip and pin machines, but the service charges for me were costing me a huge amount. Um, I'm always looking into different options because it, it varies each year who's the cheapest, but WorldPay have been great so far. Um, you can take it through your phone or you can do it online, and I can send clients links and they can pay with a link if they want to as well. Brilliant. Yeah, the same but people that we, we use. Basically, those. any system that takes credit cards, yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, so you mentioned, I think, quite early on uh, about, so obviously, the, the, as, the ba as the babies get older, even in the, sort of the, the two-week period to the six-week period, how, you know, somebody did ask, so how do things change within the posing um, as they get a bit older? Um, after about six weeks, they don't curl up as much. They have kind of straightened their limbs out more, so it's a lot harder beyond six weeks to get them in some of the more curled up poses. But sometimes I would say that actually my five-week-old babies can be easier to pose than a two-week-old baby. Um, the bigger difference really is that when they're under two weeks, they will sleep quite a lot on and off. So it's quite easy relatively to get them to sleep. With a four or five-week-old baby or six-week, it can take a bit longer to get them to sleep. But the plus side is when they are asleep, they tend to sleep a deeper sleep than a true newborn would. Um, so with an older baby... I, and often as well, it's about setting parent expectations. If you have them over four weeks or definitely over six, if you were to try that, let them know you'll probably not get the sleep shots. And then when you do get some sleepy shots, the parents think you're wonderful. Brilliant. Uh, we're getting to the last few. We're getting there, Ellie Love. We are getting there, I promise. So, um, okay, so in the sales <laughs> process, uh, the actual you know, face-to-face -face sales process, is the order being made then or do you actually allow them some time to go away and mull it over? 99% of the time it's made there. I don't tell them they can go away and mull it over, but I will always let them if they ask. Um, years back, I had a, uh, a photo shoot with a, a chain, um, and I had a horrible sales experience. It was really unpleasant and pushy. And I ordered some lovely photos, and within about three months of having these frames at home, I took them down and put them in the loft. Because every time I saw them, they made me really angry, because all I remembered was how unpleasant my sales session was. So I've always used that to do... Try and do the exact opposite. So if somebody says, we really want to think about it, fine. Um, but I'm also aware that unless you can clinch the sale in that sales session, they usually won't spend as much. So it's reluctantly that I will sometimes let them go away and think about it, but I'll never be pushy and say, no, it's now, or never threaten to delete the files or anything. I think it's um, it's just not the way I want to run my business. So. Brilliant. Um, I think you mentioned earlier that, especially with the size of the canvases and stuff, that you favoured, I think it was the... the 
the the twelve point uh, point eight crop. Is that like a standard crop then you use to make it easier with your products? Yeah, my camera shoots in three two twelve eight, so everything that I sell is just three two ratio. I don't want to be having to change crops when on client orders. Again, it's just streamlining and making it as simple as you can. Um, so if I keep everything within three two, the image they see is going to be the same whether whatever product they order it with. Brilliant. Uh, okay, so we're getting there. Um, so you obviously you referred to the mats. Um, recommendations, where to get them from? Who do you use? I get mine from a company called Cotswold Mounts. I think it's cotswoldmounts.co.uk. Um, they've got all sorts of different colours and different options there, but that's the one that I use. They're quite a thick, they're not the cheapest, but they're a lovely thick quality, so I like those ones. Uh, okay, and uh, the other question there was, um, oh, your other products, your canvases and stuff, who do you, who do you favour for those? Uh, canvases I use artsycouture.co.uk. Brilliant. Uh, well, we are last couple of questions. Um, is it one price for the wall art, or is it dependent on the size? Depends on the size. The bigger the yeah, more expensive the bigger it is. Brilliant. And your studio is that away from your home, or is it in your home premises? No, no. It's it's um it's an old factory that's been converted. It's a very rural. It's an old rectory. It's got a big sweeping driveway up, big trees, squirrels, and rabbits. No shop front whatsoever. Um, but that works. I don't want walking clients. I want them to have to book and come by appointment only. Um, but no, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about five miles away from where I live at home. Brilliant. And it's actually really nice having a separate studio to home. Just that little separation gives you a bit more control back in your life balance, I think. Excellent. Um, well, Ellie, that's all of the questions. But apart from a few people just saying a little bit more information on sort of the the one to one courses and stuff. Now, I, I know we chatted earlier. You do a day and you do two days. You've got options available. Is that right? Yeah, um, absolutely. You can come in for a day with me or two. Sometimes people have found a two-day one is more intensive and they can get a lot more hands-on experience or have more than one baby and so they can leave feeling that they can confidently go and replicate it. But basically, all the, there's lots of information on my website or you can email me for more details. Um, but it's very much tailored to your needs. So we can look at where your work currently is, whether you're in a business or starting up or you want to refine the posing or you want to work on your editing or you want some marketing or a little bit of everything. And we'll put together a personalised itinerary for you. So it's very much tailored to, to your needs. Um, and I've got lots of different testimonials and quotes from people going up. So you can have a look at those as well and see what people think you've been on them. Brilliant. And as I said, guys, you'll be getting an uh, email from us. The links have already gone out in the chat panel, but you get an email from us all tomorrow. Uh, all of you guys who registered for the webinar get an email with the links to Ellie's website and, of course, the 10% discount code that she's offered on all of that. Um, Ellie, loads of feedback thanking you for tonight and uh, and staying with us and answering all the questions, and obviously from me as well. Uh, thank you. Um, just, just masses of information, so lots for people to take in. Um, as I said, though, you've done the first series for us is a huge series already on the Photography Academy. So that's, uh, I think, more about getting started as well as the photography, isn't it? That's all what we've concentrated at at the moment, really, on, on there. But we've already chatted that you're going to do some more film with this year, and we're going to do a bit more on the maternity side of things with you as well. That's right, I think. Can't wait for that. Yeah, we're good. Excellent. Brilliant.